Hello and welcome back to more AEW on TW 2020. We are here fourth. What? Why am I saying fourth? Second week of February on our show of Collision. We are in the Ocean Center in Wisconsin. Out here, I think it's uh, Wausau. And Adam Page defeats Brian Cage with the Buckshot Lariat. They have good chemistry. Good to know. As the match is going on, the Mogul Embassy slowly make their way toward the ring. And by the time that Hangman finishes off Brian Cage, the entire Embassy has surrounded the ring. The Gates of Agony enter first, and they're soon joined by Swerve himself. And Swerve is talking to Page off mic, and he eventually tells him to get the hell out before he gets his ass whooped. Page, go figure, refuses. You know, he's, he's fighting, he's not a coward. I, I'm not a coward! Uh, and that more of disappoints Swerve rather than anything. He's not, like, angry and... Page is then jumped from behind by someone wearing a hoodie. The Gates of Agony then also turn to beat down Page. But when Brian Cage joins to, uh, turns around to join the beatdown, Swerve just destroys him with a super kick to the back of the head or, uh, maybe, like, a behind-the-head lariat or something. He's just... Cage is wrecked. And Swerve... Calls for the hooded person to come over and finish off Brian Cage. The hood is removed to reveal Sawyer Wreck, who hits Cage with a move. I don't know Sawyer Wreck's moves at all too well. Page and Cage are laid out in the ring as the new mogul embassy heads out. Uh, Sawyer Wreck, she's someone who's more of a spectacle person than anything. So she's someone that still needs a lot of work, but, I mean, pretty tall for a female wrestler, so that'll be... Kind of, she's kind of replacing the muscle with Brian Cage. Sawyer X barely shorter than Brian Cage. That's really all you need to know about Brian Cage. As the Mogul Slam Embassy pass by, Tony Schiavone gets off of commentary to make an announcement. He announces the Hart Foundation Cup Classic, styled in the same way as the Continental Classic. The brackets show on screen, Tony explains that the winners of the tournament will not only get a chance for the tag team titles, but will also be the first people to get their name etched on the cup, and will also get $500,000 as a bonus. Apparently, I... let's just, uh... uh there we go. $500,000 as a bonus. Uh, so I will be showing all of the participants on screen in the uh, pink block and the white block. Uh, they are... I mean, it's a, it's a good selection of teams. Uh, as you will notice, the tag champions, Big Bill, Ricky Starks, are involved in that. Uh, but they'll be coming out in just a moment to explain their thing. Continental Classic was seen as a huge success, so... Getting that involved with tag team stuff, I think, will really help. But I'm not going to throw in another title, because there's already enough titles in AEW, so... Keeping things a little bit more subdued with that front... Uh, so instead we get the the kayfabe money bonus. I'm not actually gonna pay them each 250 k 250 grand, but yeah. Uh, but big group of teams, a uh, pretty solid setup with them. After this, Ricky Starks and Big Bill come out after the announcement, and they have mics in hands, and like they're passing by as Paige and Cage are being brought backstage. Um, while well, Starks and Big Bill are making their way for a match. And Ricky, he's the main one to be talking, he says, Well, now, now, now. I know what everyone's thinking. Why would us, the tag team champions, want to put ourselves in this tournament? I mean, if you think about it for even a second, it's kind of simple. That's some damn good money, and it's well worth our time. But, of course, as we were getting all this set up, we talked with Tony Khan about this. Now, all of our tournament matches are going to be non-title, and of course our little exhibition match right here is also non-title. But we still have plans for Revolution in two weeks' time. See, at Revolution, we're gonna put down one of the greatest tag teams of all time. We're gonna send the old legendary old mutts and the hardies out to pasture. All in the way of getting a new influx of cash. So yeah, just the... The tag champs kind of explain themselves, explaining their plans for Revolution. So they're going to have a title match at Revolution. Uh, the Hardys match will be for the belts, but 
they will also have the tournament going on. So, yeah. Of course, none of those will be for uh, tag titles. As they defeat Top Flight in about seven and a half minutes. They're actually both out... Well, okay, Ricky is tied with Darius. Um, I mean, Top Flight, they're good flippy boys. So, I guess... And Dante, okay, Dante has a hot move. That that probably explains it a little bit more. But he's a six seven rated match. Not bad whatsoever. After this we see Chris Statlander in a locker room with the rest of the best friends. Uh the tag team, Chuck and Trent, they're complaining about how they're not being involved in the tournament. Like they they knew about the tournament. This is something where it's one of those things where I'm just going to kayfabe that Tony Khan, you know, made some tweet like, hey, we have a huge announcement on Collision. That's what this is. And, you know, all the, the, the roster, of course, knows about this. And the, the best friends, Chuck and Trent, they're complaining about how they, they are not included in the tournament. While... Uh, Orange Cassidy doesn't look like he has 0% energy. He's still kind of pacing around. He's been a little bit on edge for his standards with all the people gunning for the international title. But eventually, there's a knock on their locker room door and it's opened by Lutha. And he says that there's a letter from Miss Statlander, hands it over to her, and Chris is really confused what she does end up reading the letter. And while we can't see what's happening or what is put on it, she's real angry about it. She crumples it up, she throws it out, and storms off, leaving the best friends kind of confused as we move on. Evenia then plays of Richard Holiday. He's, you know, he's doing his normal spiel here at Dynasty Marketing Inc. We market ourselves as the best of the best, our rarefied air, but eventually the video gets a little bit weird when there is someone crying that he doesn't know anything. The camera zooms out, pans out, to show someone, probably just a local worker, um, being kind of, he's put up against a chair, and Hammerstone and Tankman are right around him. Now he gets up from his, you know, his little boardroom chair, and he starts walking over, he says, you really think that the acclaimed aren't getting any sort of special permission from management? Look, whatever your name is, and like, Holiday, he's... I'm imagining he's kind of like kneeling down, or like crouching down, he's kind of face to face with this mysterious person, this random, generic dude out here. He says, here at Dynasty Marketing Inc., we know that we can't cut corners to make our way to the top. We know that in order to be this rarefied breed, in order to be this top breed, we need to make sure we can do everything possible. If the acclaimed are always able to get their wraps up, if they're always given this permission to go out there and say their peace of mind before every match. Well, it only seems fair that we can air our commercials. We can air our promo, our hype, every time that we appear, doesn't it? But, look, buddy, I'm not exactly certain who you work for, whether that's Rika or Hopkins or even Khan himself. But you know what? You better go to them. You better find out who can get us that permission. And you gotta get exactly what we need to get that same sort of treatment. Holly nods and Tankman and Hammerstone throw this guy to the ground. The guy is, he's like looking up, he's you know, definitely spooked. Richard Holiday, I'm imagining he's wearing, uh, probably just like a blazer, he's not wearing full, full suit. You know, probably just, you know, like slacks, got a white undershirt, blazer. Pulls out a business card from the blazer from a blazer pocket, sticks it in the guy's mouth before he and Takeman and Hammerstone leave. I'm actually really happy with this segment. It definitely, like, you could still have the Dynasty Marketing Inc. as, like, the, you know, the, the generic bougie, oh, we're the elite guys, we're the best guys out there because we're so cool. But I like this little darker twist that I added to them. I don't know, we'll see what, what whatever you guys think. Uh, let me know what you guys think, I guess. After this, Utami Hayashishida defeats Athena. 
Yeah. Tommy's pretty good because she's still unimportant ranked. Julie gets into the ring after the match and says that the takeover of AEW is slow to get under the way, but all the focus in AEW has been elsewhere. Oh well, Julie and Tommy and. <laughs> Julie and Tommy and Susan, they've been busy working in stardom. The real best women's division in the world. Well, though Nightingale's music comes out and she comes out alongside with Riho and Hikaru Shida. Willow says that, you know, you're not going to take these people slandering AEW's name like that. But they are eventually cut off by Mercedes Monet's music hitting. And Mercedes Monet Entertainment comes out. They say that both these groups, they're bickering over nothing. Because MME is being exactly what it needs. They're going to be what really ends up taking over. And she, eventually she just grabs the mic from Willow. And she's like, you know what guys, everyone shut up. I'm tired of all this. Revolution, we're going to settle this. 3v3v3. So, Mercedes Monet Entertainment versus Julia Suzu Tommy versus Shida Rihu Willow. Rihu? Riho. And Willow. So, yeah. Big uh, nine person tag team match. It's elimination just because that's the only thing that they have on um, in game. So, yeah, I guess that's the only one that really makes sense. But, yeah. The EV3v3 EV3 Tag Team Elimination. Out of the Blackpool Comic Club are seen in a dojo. Yuta is hard at work, being watched over and trained by Claudio. Brian enters, he's criticizing Yuta's form, which draws, draws a bit of defense from Claudio. Claudio's like, hey, stop being so hard on the kid. Brian, he gets in Claudio's face, he starts arguing with him, but Yuta eventually, you know, he stops everyone, he's like, guys, stop, look, Brian, I'm trying to prove, I, I want to prove how useful I am, I'm trying to prove that I'm not this disappointment that you think I am. So I'm putting all of my heart out into training for the Heart Foundation Tournament. Make sure not to disappoint Brian in, you know, make sure, I don't want to disappoint you in the process. And Brian, he is a little bit peeved that Yuda interrupted him. But he's like, you know what, alright, fine. So you know what, you, go, you gotta do a lot more training. And Yuda's like, alright, cool, finally on the same track. He gets to work, Brian does his own thing, Claudio is still kind of mentoring Yuta in his training. Of course, Yuta and Danielson are the pairing for the BCC. See how things go with that. Malachi Black defeats Dan Housen with a black mass. Uh, okay. After the match, FTR come out onto the stage, and they are livid as they storm towards the ring, but before they can get down to beat the House of Black, Bret Hart, he stops them at the ramp. Says, hey, you know what, you guys, you're in the same block of the Art Foundation Tournament. So, you know what, just get your measure of revenge there. I mean, okay, he's amused us, and he's he's about to speak. He asked for the mic that Julia Hart got in the meantime. But Julia actually is the one to speak. He says that it's kind of rich that FTR think they have the home field advantage, so to speak, with Brett in their corner that they're arrogant, and they think that they've got everything under control, but they know nothing about what's all in place against them. After she says this, Bret Hart is jumped by Jack Perry, and, you know, Jack Perry, he's just doing punches, he's not gonna make Brett do a bump. Uh, but FTR, they run, they get Jack away from them. So, Jack Perry? Is Jack Perry part of the House of Black? No, but there's something going on with that, don't worry. Or maybe do worry. Miro is then in a chapel praying with a bored looking CJ Perry, kind of just in the background. Miro finishes prayer, his prayer before sermonizing to CJ, says that Powerhouse Hobbs is nothing but a heretic. Someone who uses a holy book to further his own agenda, while the Don Callis family spit on the name of a holy god. CJ stops him saying that, you know what, you know what, Miro, I love that you respect your faith, all this stuff, but you've come a little bit too focused on that, and so I've got something prepared that can help both of us out. Miro's like, you're working behind my back, how dare you? But CJ, hey, you know what, it's worthwhile for you to have an acolyte, so to speak. Miro, he's, again, he's still questioning it for a little bit, but he ends up accepting it in the end. End of the segment. <laughs> so yeah, uh, something CJ has planned for Miro. And Billy starts to beat Red Velvet. Afterwards, Billy is hyped up about her victory. Ah, oh, I forgot to add Nyla to the story now. Uh, she's hyped up about her victory, but she's soon enough is stopped by Nyla Rose's music hitting. 
Nyla comes up, she says that she's always been a little bit intrigued by the young prospect in Billy Starks, but it's time to feast on some young prey up there in the, way, in the ring, and not in a weird way. Uh, Keith Lee interrupts her by saying that, you know, he's more than happy to allow Nyla to have a match against Billy, but Nyla, she says that there's much more planned than a match, it's gonna be total domination or some such. And before Keith can continue his response, Billy Starks, she's got momentum, she, you know, dives out of the ring, suicide dive, but Nyla catches her uh, on it, and just Samoan drop, I think Nyla does a Samoan drop, otherwise powerbomb, um, or beast bomb or whatever, and does that to Billy, Serena Deep comes out, she gets into Nyla's face, and then that earns a smack from Nyla, Brawl and Sue, security eventually breaks them up. So Nyla getting involved with Billy Starks. I've just the VCGR thing in a rather dingy looking place with Jay White kind of peeved. And he says, now, it's a good thing that we've got the guns going on with the Heart Foundation tournament, but there's still something that we need to address. That's the terrible treatment of the Bullet Club out here. I know that maybe we're not as good as we once were back when the Bullet Club ruled the roost in pro wrestling. There's something that I kind of forgot along the way that I need to do, that we need to get serious. We need to make ourselves known, don't we? Well, we get our plan for that. Don't you worry. And again, just like with Jack Perry, maybe do worry. We'll see what BCG has in mind. We move to our main event, as Will Ospreay defeats Dustin Rose with Stormbreaker. After the win, Bill, uh, Bill Ospreay, sure, gets a devilish look in his eyes before giving a hidden blade to Dustin. He prepares for another extra one. When Darby Allen's music hits, he sprints out to the ring, and the two of them, they brawl for a little bit, and at some point, eventually, Will ends up on the announcer table. Darby Allen gets into the ring, coffin drop to Will, onto the announcer table, through the announcer table, ends our show, 70 rated show. And again, I'm always happy with these, like, a low 70 is kind of ideal for me, because I'm still building up a lot of undercard people. Like, Adam Page is the highest up the card person we have, otherwise we have, you know, Will Ospreay, who's still pretty new, we have two people who are real young unknowns, we have uh, Utami, who's a complete unknown, we have Top Flight, who's still really young. So it's just building up a lot of younger pieces, which I think is definitely something that I want to do. I want to have this deeper roster, and I still do need to build up more main eventers, but also building up a very deep division where I can have a lot of people that can be like, okay, this person can, again, at least challenge for a mid-card title. Um, and some people, eventually, I'll just kind of figure out what I want to do with them enough that they can still advance into the main event scene, even if there's someone that I would kind of see as a mid-carder. Um, but still, again, it's, it's a lot of development stuff, which I'm more than happy with, but... That does end our show of Collision. We move on to Dynamite in the next episode.